Hi everyone, this is Peter, and I want to talk just a little bit about connections between uh, Greek mythology and uh, drama. This is a huge topic, and um, I'm going to barely be able to get any kind of uh, introduction in. Um, in fact, it's so huge, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, perhaps a good place to begin would be to just consider how, like the last, uh, in the last set of lectures, uh, I mentioned, uh, discussed philosophy, uh, just how persistent and contemporary uh, Greek drama is. Um, in its original form, uh, Greek drama probably wouldn't uh, appeal a whole lot to contemporary viewers, uh, that is to say viewers of today, um, but it has survived with extraordinarily uh, and a lot of relevance, I guess let's put it that way, extraordinary relevance uh, in the 2,500 years or so since its um, sort of peak era. Um, the peak era for um, uh, Greek drama, like so many uh, Greek cultural products, is probably sitting in roughly the middle end of the 5th century. Some people will talk about the classical age or uh, perhaps a little uh, too much hyperbole, the golden age of uh, Greece and, of course, its Athens-centric uh, uh, kind of descriptions. But it's, um, you know, it's certainly valid to consider uh, the historical circumstances of 5th century Greece and the authors, which have, by various, really almost have to call it miracles, uh, their works have been passed down to the present age. And by miracles, I mean, for example, the author that we're going to consider in a little bit of detail, um, Sophocles uh, apparently wrote something like 125 plays, but we have considerably uh, fewer than that uh, uh, surviving uh, at this point, at this point in time, uh, seven to be more precise. So that's a, a pretty slim uh, survival rate, less than uh, less than 10%, and Sophocles was one of the most uh, important and influential playwrights, so who knows how many uh, names and actual dramatic works are just lost uh, completely. So when I talk about uh, classical mythology, or Greek mythology in particular, and um, drama, we're talking about, much like we uh, just mentioned with regard to Homer, or Hesiod, or um, Plato, the intersection of an oral kind of, what's the right word here, indigenous cultural tradition, intersecting it with with a literary tradition that's beginning to emerge, um, as in the case of philosophy or uh, drama in the, um, in the fifth century. So to some degree, um, we are probably going to find ourselves veering off uh, in terms of the discussion toward an emphasis on the historical context of whether it's philosophy, as in the naturalist and humanist philosophers, or in the case of drama, the political and social uh, circumstances that uh, influenced its um, production and performance, and probably not digging as much into mythology as, as probably as much as we, as we could, but nevertheless, we'll try to balance that discussion. Um, I'm going to use as a basis for uh, the conversation, again, a chapter from that excellent textbook uh, from Harris and Platzner and their chapter on the House of Laius, Sophocles' Oedipus Cycle. So we're going to um, focus primarily on that, and I'll just go through the text a little bit as we go along here, as it's in uh, a PDF format. It's, it's a pretty good, diverse uh, uh, discussion, so I think we can use it as a springboard. Um, again, when we're talking about the time of Sophocles, it's one of extraordinary, <clears throat> rapid, extraordinarily rapid change. If he's born in 496, he would have seen, for example, the uh, Persian Wars, the defeat um, at the Battle of Salamis, for instance, 480, and... Um, lived into the uh, era of the Peloponnesian Wars of, uh, what is it, 421, I think, to 404. So it's, uh, sorry, 431 to, for, to 404. So it's a time of extraordinary upheaval uh, in terms of the contesting 
uh, powers in the Aegean, uh, Athens, Athenian, Hellas rises to the forefront after the Battle of Salamis, um, an extraordinary outpouring of uh, productions in uh, the visual arts, in particular uh, architecture and sculpture is seen. Um, philosophy, of course, begins to emerge with particularly vivid intensity, that humanist side, uh, in the uh, conversations of Socrates and the productions of Plato a short while after that. Um, we have Herodotus and Thucydides and the writing of history and, and on and on and on. So there's a, a kind of a a compression of uh, extraordinary intensity, a sense of transformation from the old to the new uh, that is um, beginning to build, I think. And it's worth kind of thinking about um, Greek drama as a kind of response to the challenges posed by these new intellectual disciplines, new political challenges, uh, military challenges, the idea of administering an empire, for instance, which is not something that Athens would have particularly concerns, concerned itself with in the 6th century, is at the center uh, of the issue in um, as we come into the 5th. Into the um, let's see uh, some other interesting um, interesting facts we could pick out from, uh, from this. Um, uh, the, the text I'm using here points out that um, Sophocles is a very successful playwright. And what that means is that he is a prize winner in dramatic competitions. And this is an important aspect of drama and in that intersection with the social and political. That they're part of the city festival dedicated to Dionysus. And there are going to be, in essence, uh, competitions where playwrights have to produce, uh, I think it's a trilogy and a satyr play, so basically four plays for production. Um, and the intersection of the political and social is enhanced in Athens by the, um, essentially the sponsorship by the state of these, um, you know, of these dramatic uh, uh, productions. So this is very much a kind of, not a, it's not a private enterprise. It's not a writer in an attic uh, composing a play and then hopefully, you know, a production company will pick it up or like today, you know, Netflix will will uh, green light it for production. This is really a, 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 you know, kind of a comparison you might make would be, um, you know, New York uh, producing uh a series of plays on some major political issue facing it at the time, and, and everyone watches it. Everyone uh, basically in, in Athens was expected to attend uh, these uh, the performance of these plays. Um, it's, uh, I think, particularly relevant to think about uh, Oedipus Rex. It's a slight, I can't remember if Rex is really a, a Greek word. It's definitely a Latin word. Oedipus Tyrannus is another way of uh, describing it. And Oedipus, the king, is a tricky one because Oedipus is, as we find out pretty quickly in the action, if we know the story at all, not much of a king. He's really a kind of what the word tyrant often meant in the ancient world was a fixer. He's the one who comes in and solves the problem of the Sphinx and is made ruler of the city. But he's not a king in the sense that he inherits it from his father. His kind of position is is contingent upon his ability to manage the affairs of the city of Thebes. Uh, one of the problems with the city of Thebes is that it is, and this is kind of a tradition in Athenian uh, culture, the kind of classic other, uh, the city where weird things happen. And there's a little question that the Oedipus story hinges on two critical, uh, um, terrible things. And one of those is the murder of Laius by Oedipus, and the other is the incestuous marriage of Jocasta and uh, Oedipus. So those are two very, very strange things indeed that any uh, knowledgeable Greek citizen would have been aware of going into the play. An interesting note that, that the uh, book authors point out here, which is well worth remembering, is that, and this is documented in the history of Thucydides, that there was a plague uh, in Athens in 430, and it's quite vividly described in his history of the Peloponnesian War, 
And so the urgency and desperation, particularly in the opening scene of Oedipus, is no doubt uh, a byproduct of eyewitness accounts, eyewitness experiences of that, um, you know, that tragic circumstance. It certainly gives, uh, you know, a, a kind of extraordinary acceleration to the pace of the play uh, as it opens with that crowd of petitioners outside the palace of Oedipus. Um, we'll pass over for now the psychological dimensions of um, Oedipus, in particular the Freudian uh, interpretation. I think that there's a lot of problems with integrating uh, classical drama and myth uh, using the theories of Freud, which from a contemporary psychoanalytic approach don't really have a whole lot of um, don't really have a whole lot of interest. Um, I think what would be more interesting and what isn't necessarily developed too well in this discussion, but we should touch on it really briefly, is the purpose of Greek tragedy in um, Greek society, particularly as defined by the very important uh, Greek philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle writes a book um, which is entitled The Poetics, in essence a guide to successful uh, uh, literary composition. And drama really is at the heart of the discussion, and he uh, is going to basically describe the function of drama. Aristotle is very, very big on function in terms of explaining, you know, why a thing exists or how it exists in the context of other things and how it develops and so forth. That the function of drama is in a very real sense to present before an audience and that's what theater means as a, as a viewing place, um, present before an audience circumstances and imitation of actions which inspire pity and fear. There's a, a kind of implication. Scholars have interpreted the word catharsis, C-A-T-H-A-R-S-I-S, -S, as variously purging or, you know, kind of this washing away of strong emotions. That in essence, Greek drama has a kind of political function of removing from the citizenry um, dangerous and difficult emotions by witnessing um, the actions of uh, characters in dire circumstances. And it's really kind of hard to imagine uh, anything uh, more dire than the circumstances that Oedipus finds uh, himself in. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind when we talk about that intersection of politics and um, social and cultural uh, uh, life in Athens with, with drama. Um, a constant theme in uh, Oedipus that's worth keeping in mind is that inexorable kind of march toward fate that Oedipus uh, finds himself caught in. And fate is a big deal in uh, Greek culture. Even the gods ultimately are subject to it. And oracles are constantly popping up uh, in Greek drama and elsewhere in Greek literature to point out uh, what's you know what's going to happen next. Um, this certainly happens in the Iliad, the Odyssey. Um, we have um, oracles in um, uh, Oedipus Rex, uh, or an oracle to be precise, Tiresias. A prophet of Apollo, and we have to remember that Apollo is the sort of plague god, and Tiresias is summoned um, to make uh, sense of a declaration by another oracle at Delphi as to you know how to remove this so-called pollution, and pollution is another important uh, theme besides the idea of divine fate and oracles that a great wrong has been committed, and that um, this. Uh, wrong has to be corrected by the expulsion of the committer of that wrong from the city. Um, there is a certain degree, and critics have commented on this, of dramatic irony. That is to say, the audience knows that the person who's committed the wrong is the same person who's demanding an investigation of the wrong, um, and that's Oedipus uh, himself. Anyway, these are just a few remarks to get uh, the story uh, started. In the next lecture, I'll go a little bit more into the play itself and some of the things uh, that we can take away from it in terms of understanding classical mythology.